Welcome everyone to the University of Hawaii Cancer Center fourth Quest for the Cure Starlight Lecture. My name is Jonathan Cho and I will be serving as your moderator for this evening's lecture entitled, Learn from the Experts on Pancreatic Cancer. Before we get started, I wanted to uh, make a few announcements regarding the lecture. I'd like to inform all the attendees that this webinar will be recorded and the recording along with the presentation slides will be posted on the UH Cancer Center website as soon as it is available. And for those of you who had missed the previous Cure, uh, Quest for the Cure Starlight lectures, the recordings are available on the UH Cancer Center website at uhcancercenter.org slash quest. During the lecture, the chat box will be turned off. For those of you who would like to submit questions, please use the question and answer box instead. Also, it's very important that our attendees know about a survey link to give us some feedback and the organizers of this feedback uh, to, uh, to plan future lectures. An email will be sent to our attendees within the next 24 hours with the survey link. And as a special thank you for completing the survey, a mahalo gift will be mailed to all of you. So let's get started. This evening, we have the good fortune to hear from two accomplished clinical scientists, Dr. Linda Wong and Dr. Jared Okoba. Dr. Linda Wong is a general and transplant surgeon who's practicing in Honolulu but who also holds academic appointments as a full professor of surgery at the UH Cancer Center and the John A. Byrne School of Medicine. Dr. Jared Okoba is a medical oncologist practicing in Honolulu and also holds academic appointments as an associate professor of medicine and oncology at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center and the John A. Byrne School of Medicine. Before we hear from the experts, I would like to share a few com com comments on pancreatic cancer, which I will call the problem. We can have to share the slide. In the United States in 2021, there will be 60,430 new cases and 448,220 deaths attributable to pancreatic cancer. Cancer of the pancreas is the fourth most common cause of cancer-related deaths in men and women. The incidence of pancreatic cancer is increasing, which is quite alarming, with a five-year overall survival of 9%. We also know there are ethnic and gender differences in incidence and mortality rates, which had major implications for our diverse ethnic population in Hawaii. So at this time, as the, and that as being a springboard, I would like to turn the virtual lectern over to Dr. Wong, who will speak to us tonight on pancreatic cancer and surgery. Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Cho. And uh, I'd like to thank the University of Hawaii Cancer Center um, for inviting me to give this lecture. I also want to thank all of you for attending tonight and taking time off from your busy Thursday afternoon to join us for a, an hour of pancreas cancer. Um, my task was to talk to you tonight about pancreas cancer surgery. And um, what we're going to talk about first is we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy and what your pancreas does. Um, some various pancreas tumors. And then I'll show you lots of pretty pictures of surgery of the pancreas. Um, we'll talk briefly about complications in pancreas surgery and the outcome. So where is your pancreas exa exactly? Well, your pancreas kind of sits in the back and it's behind your liver and your stomach and all of your intestines. And you can see here, it's kind of this yellowy organ here. that sits way in the back. It's closer actually to your spine. Um, it's about 15 centimeters long. And there's different parts of your pancreas. There's a head of your pancreas, as we describe it. 
There's the tail of your pancreas, which is out on the, uh, in the back, okay? There's also a bile duct, which runs right through it. And the bile duct drains um, bile from your liver and it goes into the intestine. So the largest section is actually in the middle and it's called the body of the pancreas. So there are several different types of cells in your pancreas. There are endocrine cells, and these um, cells secrete hormones into the blood vessels. They make things like insulin and other hormones that help control your blood sugar. There are also other cells in your pancreas called exocrine cells, which secrete um, pancreas enzymes, and it um, drains all of your enzymes into your intestines so that you can digest your food. So as we mentioned, um, your pancreas has two functions. One of them is endocrine, it's to make the insulin and the glucagon, which help control your blood sugar, and exocrine function, which um, these are glands that are attached to your pancreas duct. And the pancreas duct is also attached to your duodenum. And enzymes are released and help you digest food. There are various diseases of the pancreas, including pancreatitis and um, pancreatic cysts, but what we're gonna concentrate on tonight are malignant tumors of the pancreas. Um, within that, there are cystic tumors um, and they're also solid tumors. And the two main ones are neuroendocrine and um, pancreas cancer, which is the common cancer that we all know about. So here's our picture of the pancreas again, and um, the two different types. One is adenocarcinoma, which is a gland cancer, and a neuroendocrine tumor, which is a cancer of those endocrine cells that we talked about. So the types of surgeries that we do for your pancreas are um, in two main areas. One is potentially curative, um, and we do these for patients in which we do many tests, and all of the testing suggests that the cancer is localized to the pancreas. And surgery is done to remove all of the cancer. Now, for those patients who have cancer that spread to other areas, we do what's called palliative surgery. And surgery is done to relieve symptoms, but not cure the cancer. And what we're relieving is that uh, intestinal blockage. Uh, we might do this to stop bleeding, and we might do this to relieve bile duct block blockage. So what surgeons often do um, before we do the, any type of surgery is we do this thing called a staging laparoscopy. So what we do is we put, while you're asleep, um, and you need general anesthesia for this, we put in a camera into your belly and we look inside, and this allows us to assess the extent of the tumor. So we're just basically putting cameras in. And what we see on the inside is we can in see small lesions that might be on top of your liver um, that may preclude us from doing any curative surgery. And sometimes the x-rays that we do are not really good at seeing these tiny little things. And sometimes they're the size of little sesame seeds. So the laparoscopy allows us to look around and see that before we make a bigger incision. Um, staging laparoscopy can also identify peritoneal implants. So sometimes if people have tumor and it's um, stuck to the wall of your abdomen, you can kind of see here these little seeds that are here. And again, this precludes curative surgery. So if the staging laparoscopy shows that um, cancer is spread outside of the pancreas, this prevents the surgeon from curing a patient. And so if we find something in the abdominal wall or in the liver or elsewhere, then we stop the curative surgery. So some of the surgeries we can do after the staging laparoscopy is we can do something called a distal pancreatectomy. And this is done for tumors in the body and the tail of the pancreas. Um, we can do um, a Whipple procedure, which is named after the doctor who described it. And this is a pancreatic duodenectomy. And for this is tumors at the head of the pancreas. And in some cases, um, we can remove the entire pancreas. So what we do in a distal pancreatectomy, this is tumors that are out in the tail and maybe the body of the pancreas. So we are surgically removing this part of the pancreas. We also take out the spleen because the spleen is usually uh, right next to it, and it can also um, have cancer cells right near the spleen. And you, you can live without your spleen. What your spleen does is it makes antibodies and it breaks down old blood cells. And um, people live perfectly fine without their spleen. Now this Whipple procedure is a much more complex thing, and this is for tumors that are at the head of your pancreas. Um, and I'm gonna show this to you step-by-step step what we do. 
So this is your normal anatomy before surgery. So you have your stomach and it goes around to this part of the intestine called the duodenum. And the head of your pancreas is right here. This is where your tumor is. So the goal is to remove this head of the pancreas. So what we do is we, we are removing this part of the pancreas, we're removing the bile ducts. We're also taking out your gallbladder here because you don't really need that. And we're taking all of your duodenum. And so you're kind of left with some pieces. You're left with front half of your stomach and intestine and a bile duct just hanging out there. Um, the next part of the procedure is the deconstruction. And what we have to do is we have to connect something to this pancreas so it can drain. We have to connect something to the bile duct so that your bile can drain. And then we're connecting something to your stomach. So I usually tell patients that I'm basically rearranging the furniture. Now, if we can't do those curative surgeries, we sometimes do palliative surgeries. And the goals of palliative surgery is to relieve bile duct blockage and to relieve your stomach blockage. So there, um, normally what happens is that bile flows through your pancreas and goes into your duodenum. And um, this pancreas cancer can block the flow. And when it blocks the flow, then bile is basically stuck inside your liver and it makes your um, eyes yellow, it makes your skin yellow, it makes your urine really dark. It also makes you really itchy. And so ways we can um, relieve the blockage, we can do it with a gastroenterologist, we can do it with a radiologist, or we can do it with a surgeon. So what um, an endoscopist would do, this would be a gastroenterologist, is that they would put a scope down your throat into your stomach, and then they would go all the way to your little opening where the bile duct is coming out. And they would put in a stent inside your bile duct. And this is either like a plastic straw or a, a thin metal tube, which they can use to relieve the blockage. If we have the radiologist do it, what they do is they stick a needle through your liver, they find your bile duct, and they put a little wire down here, and then they put a little metallic tube across your bile duct. Now, if a surgeon does it, we just cut off your bile duct here and we bring a loop of intestine up here without taking out the rest of the thing, like a Whipple procedure. Now, the other thing we do in palliative surgery is to get rid of the stomach blockage, okay? Now, this, this pancreas cancer can sometimes grow so big that it blocks your duodenum. So food comes through your stomach, but it can't go past it. The patients are unable to eat. And what we do in this situation is we are just relieving the blockage. So we leave all of this here and we bring a loop of intestine up here to relieve the blockage. This can also be done by a um, gastroenterologist. And what they do is they put a scope down and they go past the blockage and they stretch it open and they put in a little metal stent there um, to stretch um, and allow food to go through. Now, some of the complications of pancreas surgery. Well, any surgery that you have, you can have blood loss. And probably about a third of the patients uh, might be need, need a blood transfusion. Always a chance you can get infections, like a wound infection or a pneumonia or a urine infection. And all these surgeries require anesthesia. So you do have to be asleep for this. Um, surgery, complications that are more specific. If we don't sew the pancreas well, or if you don't heal it well, you can have pancreas leakage. You can have bile leakage and you can get pancreatitis or irritation of the pancreas. And sometimes the stomach doesn't like you're operating on it and it gets a little slow at um, digesting foods. So these are all things that can happen um, after pancreas surgery. Now the long-term consequences, sometimes people lose some weight from this. Sometimes they get a malnutrition. Um, they may not absorb the fats as well. And sometimes we have to give patients pancreas enzymes so that they can absorb food a little bit better. Um, about 15 to 30% of patients end up having diabetes after this operation. And some of it is because we're taking out some of those pancreas cells that make your insulin. And there's always a chance your cancer can come back. So in terms of outcome, about two to 4% of patients are gonna die related to some sort of complication from pancreas surgery. Um, the five-year survival after pancreas surgery is about 30%. But kind of keep in mind that without any surgery, your five-year survival is probably in the order of five to 10%. However, only 15% to 20% um, of patients can actually receive surgery 
that the vast majority of cancers are found a little bit late and we are unable to do surgery for them. I'm gonna give you some patient examples. I'll keep in mind that these are not HIPAA violations because I found this all on the internet. But there are some famous people that have had pancreas cancer. Um, the first one is um, our, the, the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She was initially found to have a pancreas cancer in 2009 and she had a distal pancreatectomy and a splenectomy. She did really well for about 11 years, but she had a recurrence of her pancreas cancer and she was treated with radiation. She eventually died in 2020. Um, Patrick Swayze from our old favorite movie, Dirty Dancing, um, he presented in 2007 with digestive problems and weight loss. His risk factor for this cancer was that he was a smoker. He was found to have advanced pancreatic cancer and was not a candidate for any surgery. He just had chemotherapy and subsequently died. And then everybody's favorite game show, Jeopardy. Um, as we all know, this was in the news recently, Alex Trebek, he was diagnosed with very advanced pancreas cancer in 2019. He only um, received chemotherapy and he eventually passed away. Um, Michael Landon, this is, um, from the old Little House in the Prairie movies. He was diagnosed with pancreas cancer at 54 and his cancer had spread to the liver even at diagnosis. And this particular article that I found, they thought it was, uh, his, they were questioning if his cancer was related to being, um, his being near a nuclear laboratory. Finally, there's Steve Jobs, the, one of the co-founders of Apple. He actually had a neuroendocrine tumor and his um, tumor was in the hormone producing cells. He had a surgical treatment um, and we, he was told that surgery was best, but he kind of opted for some alternative therapies first. He eventually had a pancreas resection. He had spread to the liver and he was one of those rare patients that got a liver transplant for um, localized spread to the liver. But he eventually died from this as well. So in conclusion, there, um, there are two main types of cancer surgery. One is palliative, one is curative. And the type of surgery that we do is dependent on the location of the tumor. Surgery can be quite complex and only about 20% will have some type of complication. Most of the patients with pancreas cancer will have two advanced cancer to consider any curative surgery. And hopefully um, Dr. Akoba can enlighten us on some newer chemotherapy with the surgery that might be more helpful in improving long-term survival. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for that very informative and uh, very clear explanation of pancreatic surgery. I think we should uh, call it pancreatic cancer surgery made simple. It's a very excellent talk you gave. Our next speaker will be Dr. Jared Akoba, who will speak to us on personalized therapy for pancreatic cancer. Dr. Akoba. All right, thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> so I am a medical oncologist. Um, I see, like Dr. Wong, patients with pancreatic cancer from early stage to late stage. And when we see patients, we try to develop a therapy program, a treatment that's specific and personalized for each individual patient. Tonight, we'll be talking about uh, early stage cancer and advanced stage cancer. For early stage cancer, I'll be talking about the timing of chemotherapy around surgery. And for advanced cancer, we'll go into a little bit about choosing appropriate treatment for each patient. So in Hawaii, this, uh, these data are actually from the Hawaii Tumor Registry. You can see that a large portion of patients cancer uh, identify as Japanese, but pancreatic cancer does affect all ethnicities. When it comes to age groups, nearly half of the patients are 70 years or over. Uh, this is important and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. So let's start with early stage cancer. So early stage cancers are cancers that can be removed with surgery. Uh, like Dr. Wong was describing, these are stage one 
cancers like the one depicted here, which is in the pancreas invading into the small intestine. And Dr. Wong showed how she can remove the entire Surgery is important because it is the only curative mortality After surgery, we almost always recommend chemotherapy to decrease the chance of cancer coming back. With surgery alone, the average survival is only about two years. If we add a chemotherapy like gemcitabine, the average survival is up to 35 months. And if we add a combination of chemotherapies after surgery, uh, such as Ophirinox, which is a combination of 5-FU oxaloplatin, Average survival has increased to 54 months. And that's depicted in the graph here. Uh, the vertical axis being the number of patients, or sorry, percent of patients who are alive. X axis or the horizontal axis being time and months. You can see the red line here <clears throat> portraying the patients who received Fulfirinox chemotherapy. And on average, this group tends to do better than those who received gemcitabine. So if giving chemotherapy after surgery is helpful, what about giving chemotherapy before surgery, something we call neoadjuvant chemotherapy? And this is a strategy we use for cancers like breast cancer. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy does have some advantages. Uh, the chemotherapy may shrink down the cancer and allow um, Dr. Wong to have a better chance of removing this, the cancer with what we call clear cancer left behind. It may also prevent the spread of cancer because we're giving the chemotherapy earlier, sooner after the diagnosis. The chemotherapy may be able to treat cancer, even cancer cells that we cannot see on our CT scans. <clears throat> also, after surgery, like Dr. Wong mentioned, there can be some complications and this could delay chemotherapy. And so if we give the chemotherapy up front, people will be in better shape and they may tolerate the chemotherapy better. There are some potential downsides with giving the chemotherapy first. One is that the cancer could grow during the chemotherapy and we could lose that window when the cancer is potentially resectable. And the second is that side effects from chemotherapy could delay surgery. So what is best? chemotherapy first or surgery first? It's still a question that we are looking for an answer. And there is a national clinical trial, A021806, in which half of the patients will get surgery first, followed by chemotherapy. and The other half will get chemotherapy first, followed by surgery. This study will help to tell us which treatment strategy may be best and hopefully it will also help us to personalize therapy by identifying specific characteristics of patients who may benefit from chemotherapy first and those that may benefit from surgery first. This is a national trial and it's open and uh, available to patients in Hawaii through the UH Cancer Center. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about advanced cancer and we'll focus on two topics patients and immunotherapy. So advanced pancreatic cancer is cancer that is treatable, but not typically curable. This is typically stage three or stage four cancer, like the one shown here, where there's a cancer in the body of the pancreas that has spread through the bloodstream to the liver. Chemotherapy is usually the standard treatment for these patients, but how do we choose the best treatment for any individual? As I mentioned earlier, uh, in Hawaii and similar, similarly across the U.S., the vast majority of patients, or I should say nearly a majority of patients who are diagnosed with pancreatic cancer are 70 years or older. Now, this is different from patients who are in clinical trials, where only about 20% of patients are 70 years or older. And this has a consequence in that the results of these clinical trials may not be applicable We know from studies that older patients do not usually fare as well as younger patients. As 
we get older, we have more comorbid illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease. And because of that, older patients are often on multiple medications that could interfere or interact with chemotherapy medicines. Older patients may have difficulty with transportation and studies have also shown that chemotherapy side effects are more often seen and more pronounced in patients who are older. Now we can't generalize and we do also have studies showing that fit elderly patients do as well as younger patients. So what is the best chemotherapy for patients who are 70 years and over? Here we have another clinical trial that is available in Hawaii. It's a national study that's being run through the UH Cancer Center. And it is open to patients who are 70 years or over with metastatic or stage four pancreatic cancer. These patients undergo a geriatric assessment. And this assessment looks at things like functional status. So how many falls has the patient had in the last six months? Are they able to go to the bathroom and take a shower on their own? Can they balance their checkbook and go to the market? Uh, it looks at comorbid illnesses. It looks at cognition. So is the patient experiencing any memory problems? And also assesses the nutritional status. For people who score well on the geriatric assessment, they're deemed to be fit patients and treated like younger patients. For those who don't score as well, such as a patient who's suffering from dementia or was in a wheelchair and needs assistance with taking a shower, <clears throat> these patients are considered frail and low dose chemotherapy, or in some cases, no chemotherapy may be the best treatment for those patients who are in between, they are characterized as vulnerable patients. And this trial is assigning half of the patients to receive a chemotherapy regimen of gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel, seen in arm A, or the regimen in arm B of 5-FU and liposomal arrhythmia. We're hoping that this study will show that the geriatric assessment personalized treatment for elderly patients with pancreatic cancer. Let's finish up talking about immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a hot topic. And what we, when we talk about immunotherapy nowadays, we're usually referring to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And these are medicines that remove the brain and allow the immune system to treat cancer. So in this cartoon, you can see the T cell here on the left side. And the T cell is part of our immune system. And in this picture, it is recognizing the tumor cell as being something that's foreign and needs to be removed from the body. However, in this case, the tumor cell is expressing a protein called PDL1. And this binds to a protein on the T cell called PD1. This interaction serves as a break in the immune system and turns this T cell off. So this T cell cannot destroy the tumor cell as long as this interaction is taking place. And so what we've developed are medications. Or PDL1 on the tumor cell and prevent this interaction from taking place. This removes the breaks on the immune system. It allows the T cell to be in this on position, recognize the cancer cell as being foreign and get rid of it. So there's a lot of excitement around immunotherapy, but unfortunately the initial studies in pancreatic cancer did not show a benefit. What was seen is that immunotherapy can be very effective in what we call MSI high cancers. MSI high cancers, they have a mistake where they don't repair their mutations or mistakes in DNA, and this makes them susceptible to immunotherapy. One example of this is colon cancer. So about 4% of colon cancers are MSI high, and immunotherapy is an excellent treatment for these patients. Now, there's a small number of pancreatic cancers, about 1% to 3% that are MSI high. And so 
we wanted to know, can these MSI high pancreatic cancers, would they respond to immunotherapy? Pembrolizumab is an, an example of one of those immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it was tested in patients with MSI high pancreatic cancers. <clears throat> About one in five patients had their tumor shrink down by at least a third with pembrolizumab. And in fact, one patient on the study, their cancer disappeared completely. For those patients whose cancer shrunk down, the cancer stayed under control for a little over a year on average. And so by identifying these cancers that are MSI high, it allows us to personalize treatment for patients only a small percentage. We're hoping that if we're able to identify similar targets in other cancers, we can also develop similar therapies. So in summary, adjuvant chemotherapy or chemotherapy after surgery improves survival for early stage pancreatic cancer. And we know that neoadjuvant therapy may offer some benefits. And so we have this ongoing trial comparing neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy for pancreatic cancer patients. For advanced pancreatic cancer, we have ongoing research that focuses on personalizing treatment. So the geriatric assessment we're hoping will help to identify which treatments are appropriate for which patients, elderly patients who are over 70. And we have found that immunotherapy can be effective for patients with MSI Thank you for allowing me to present, and I will turn it back over to Jonathan for the question and answer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Koba, for that excellent summary of where the field of the non-surgical treatment of, chemo, of uh, pancreatic cancer is moving. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's made some great strides, and I think immunotherapy and other forms of chemotherapy have changed. Hopefully we can change the course of this disease. So we're gonna move on now to the question and answer session. Um, please feel free to submit your questions to the uh, question answer box. Uh, I'm going to now look at some questions and uh, let me just uh, direct the first question to Dr. Um, Dr. Wong. Uh, this question is, in what situations are removing the entire pancreas recommended, especially if the cancer is located in the body of the pancreas? This was listed as surgical options. Linda? So, you know, a total pancreatectomy can be done um, in certain situations, but it does have um, quite a bit of consequences. Um, you end up being a pretty brittle diabetic because you basically have no insulin. So you end up having a lot of, uh, needing a lot of insulin shots and monitoring of blood sugars. Um, you know, I have done this a couple of times, um, but it, ha it had been for more cystic tumors and not the typical um, adenocarcinoma that we talk about. So it's, it's not commonly done for the typical pancreas cancer. Um, it's more done probably for the cystic tumors, which have a little bit better prognosis. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to direct uh, the next question uh, to uh, question is, how do you get pancreatic cancer? What are the screening tests, if any, for pancreatic cancer? And what are the common symptoms of pancreatic cancer? So Linda, Dr. Wong, Dr. Koba, you can both weigh in on this. You wanna start, Jared? Go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Wong. So, uh, uh, you know, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we don't have good screening test for pancreatic cancer. It, it would be, it'd be great if we did um, because finding cancer early will allow it, allow us to uh, have a better chance at curing it. Um, 
for people with certain hereditary uh, genetic syndromes, things like uh, BRCA, um, which we usually associate with breast cancer and ovarian cancer, these patients are also at a higher risk for pancreatic cancer. And we are looking at things like MRI or endoscopic ultrasound to help detect cancers early in these patients who are at a higher risk. Um, but otherwise, there aren't any screening tests that I'm aware of for the general public. Dr. Wong, any yeah. comments so about early symptoms, yeah. early detection? And, um, so, you know, the risk factors for pancreas cancer that's most commonly talked about is smoking. Um, but, you know, it's not to the point where we have a screening test. It's not like a mammogram where everybody has a mammogram, every woman has a mammogram after a certain age and we can find breast cancer early. It's not that situation because we don't have good screening tests and we can't really get a CAT scan or an MRI on everyone. Um, you know, there are some studies that suggest that a new onset of diabetes when you haven't had it before might be a, an early sign of developing pancreas cancer. And I know there's some studies going on in the US where they're taking new diabetics and trying to screen them for pancreas cancer. But it's not, there's nothing, there's no guidelines or set standards about who should be screened for pancreas cancer other than the genetic things that um, Dr. Koba talked about. It's unfortunate. Dr. Wong, what about pancreatitis? Is that an early warning sign of pancreatic cancer? This is another question it, from the audience. It, it can be, but not always. I mean, commonly people get pancreatitis from gallstones and from drinking too much alcohol, um, but it's not every pancreatitis means you're gonna get pancreas cancer. Some of the cystic cancers are probably more likely to present with pancreatitis, but um, you know, other ones, not necessarily. So um, it can be. And patients who have um, chronic pancreatitis, meaning that they have repeated episodes of pancreatitis, be it from alcohol or something else, those patients are probably a little more likely to get pancreas cancer. But again, not to the point where we screen them. Dr. Akoba, anything on symptoms, early detection, or any other comments? Uh, no, I think okay. we kind of covered it. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's a difficult situation. Okay. Um, here, here's another, I, I think uh, Dr. Koba touched a little bit on this, on the genetics of pancreatic cancer, but here's a question. Is pancreatic cancer hereditary? So most pancreatic cancers, as far as we know, are not hereditary. Um, in the U.S. at least, though, it is recommended that anyone who is diagnosed with pancreatic cancer have genetic counseling and genetic testing uh, because we do know that there are some syndromes like the um, mutations in BRCA, BRCA that I had mentioned, um, and other similar mutations where uh, those families may be at a higher risk for developing pancreatic cancer. Um, let me uh, direct this at Dr. Wong. Um, we know that uh, patients have surgery, roughly 20% may have curative surgery. And you nicely discuss some of the complications of that. But there is a question here is about any type of effective nutritional therapy. And we can put it in the setting of post-operative or in patients who have had curative surgery. Uh, you, uh, can you comment on effective nutritional therapy that you are aware of that might change, maybe lower the risk of recurrence, maybe improve survival, maybe limit the complications of pancreatic surgery? I think that if you're better nourished, you know, you probably live longer no matter how you look at it. But I don't know that there's one particular nutritional therapy that will be prolonging your life by itself. I think a lot of these patients, when they come in for surgery, a lot of them are pretty malnourished. And if they've had chemotherapy beforehand, you know, that's another reason why they might be malnourished. And in general, you know, improving your nutrition 
you know, either with supplements or, or more intake or um, that will um, improve your outcome and that will probably prolong your survival. But I can't tell you that there's any specific you know, type of nutrition that, that's gonna be better than others. I mean, I, I know there are a lot of new fad diets out there. We talk about the Mediterranean diet and I have patients juicing and you know, trying lots of different things. And I can't mm -hmm. tell you that one specific one is better than the other at, at prolonging your survival. Do you have any thoughts, Jared? No, I would agree. I, I usually tell people that, you know, the main thing is that you get in enough calories. Um, you know, if you have the luxury of being able to eat and tolerate anything, usually diets that are higher in fruits and vegetables are better. Um, but I don't think there's anything that you absolutely have to avoid. Thank you. Um, Along the same lines of uh, surgery, and uh, you spoke of chemotherapy after surgery, uh, here's a question. What is the life expectancy of someone who undergoes curative surgery? What, what can you, what do you tell these patients after they've had their Whipple procedure or total pancreatectomy or distal pancreas? Uh, what do each of you tell patients in terms of their life expectancy. Dr. Wong, Dr. The, Koba. Mm -hmm. I tell them that the five-year survival, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent, you know, and a lot of it depends on nutritional status, size of the tumor, and lots of other things. But I'll give them that ballpark. Um, and I, and, and um, you know, if things change if they're better nourished or if the chemotherapy works for them postoperatively. Dr. Koba, after you see a patient from Dr. Wong and uh, uh, talk with them about the benefits of chemotherapy after curative surgery, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of life expectancy do you uh, communicate to the patient? Yeah, uh, again, similar to what uh, Linda had said, um, I think one of the more recent trials that we had showed that surgery followed by chemotherapy with Pofirinox, the average survival is close to five years. So um, it is getting better, um, but it, it's very dependent on the cancer and, and the patient. Okay. Here's an interesting question, uh, and I'll put it out to both of you. Are there any clinical trials for personalized neoantigen vaccines for pancreatic cancer? Dr. Okoba, Dr. Wong. Um, not, not in Hawaii. Um, I think most of the vaccine work for pancreatic cancer is still being done at Johns Hopkins. Uh, they have a pretty robust program. Uh, there may be other centers as well, uh, but nothing mm -hmm. that we have here, unfortunately. Dr. Wong, anything about uh, those patients? Uh, do you have the first I'll crack at the tissue, I guess, don't you? <laughs> I'll, I'll defer that to uh, Jared's answer. Okay. I'm, I'm not aware of any um, specific okay. vaccine. Um, here's a question. Um, and I think along the lines of, uh, there's someone who had a, I have a patient with IPMN. How do you approach or counsel them, the cystic disease of the uh, pancreas regarding early surgical intervention especially if they are apprehensive for major surgery. Dr. Wong, I'll direct that question to you since you will commonly see so, these patients. So an IPMN is a, is a cystic tumor and the vast majority of them are benign. Um, but some patients have, um, they do have some malignant potential and the ones that do are ones that are increasing in size, um, ones that are symptomatic or sometimes within the cyst. And it's like a blister, it's like a pocket of water. Um, but if the cysts have solid areas, um, that may also be uh, more suggestive of a, of a malignancy. And so this is something that we usually follow with serial MRIs. And if we notice any of these worrisome signs, then we would recommend surgery for that. Um, and you know, I'm not sure what to tell you about being apprehensive. Um, it's always scary to think that you might have cancer um, and everybody has a different level of 
of fear. Uh, some people want this cyst taken out regardless, and other people are willing to wait and see um, for any symptoms or any worrisome signs. How would you follow these patients if one elects not to have surgery? We would follow it with serial MRIs, and we probably do this um, every three to six months, depending on um, how worried we are. If we see something increasing in size, we may follow it a little closer. Um, if it's not really changed in size or, or how the, it looks um, on the scan, we may spread it out to every six months. And we're also monitoring for symptoms. So we ask the patients if they have pain, if they've been to the emergency room for nausea. And these, are, these are patients who can get pancreatitis from this. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, is there a reason why chemotherapy stops being effective? Does the body build tolerance to it? Dr. Koba? <clears throat> Yeah, unfortunately, um, chemotherapy, even if it's initially effective, uh, oftentimes at some point, the cancer actually becomes resistant to it. Um, cancer finds a way to evade the chemotherapy. And, and another thing can happen is that, you know, after people have had chemotherapy for a while, the side effects from the chemotherapy can start to accumulate and Sometimes we need to stop chemotherapy for that reason as well. Okay. Um, along the same line for Dr. Koba, are there any other effective chemotherapy drugs that are being used other than the ones mentioned, specifically for stage three and stage four? So I assume the non-surgical patient. Um, we have a number of chemotherapy regimens, I think, um, all of them were mentioned at some point in my, in my slide. So I guess there's not that many of them. Uh, there are other studies that we have available here in Hawaii. Uh, some of them are not specific for pancreatic cancer, um, but when we look for mutations or alterations in the DNA and the cancer, we are sometimes able to match those up with potentially what we call targeted therapies. Um, and these are experimental, but there is uh, some scientific background behind it to uh, provide some rationale. So, so there's a number of potential therapies out there. Okay. Um, this can be directed at either or both of you. Uh, is obesity a risk factor for pancreatic cancer? And is there any studies on whether high sugar consumption or high cholesterol are causal risk factors. And I guess along the same line, is there any lifestyle changes that may decrease one's risk of pancreatic cancer? Both of you can weigh in on this. this. Go ahead, I'll start with Linda in the Wong, Dr. Wong. Obesity, obesity is a risk factor for pancreas cancer. But I don't know if there's any studies on whether what you eat, high sugar or high cholesterol, are really specifically the problem or whether that increases your risk. I don't know. Jared? Yeah, not, not that I'm aware of, not a direct risk. OK. So it's OK to have your ice cream tonight. <laughs> yeah. Good. OK. Okay, there's a question. I think they're probably a combination, and this is going back to early detection, the importance of early detection, and uh, obviously because of uh, period of surgery and what we can do. But uh, the question is, uh, how is pancreatic cancer initially detected? Jaundice, abdominal pain, weight loss, and uh, along that same line, you know, what are the early symptoms or the common symptoms that one should raise, uh, both from a health provider, as well as a patient standpoint, uh, to, to raise the level of suspicion. Uh, and and uh, both of you can wait, Dr. Wong, because you see a lot so, of these patients initially, obviously. So cancers at the head of the pancreas typically present with painless jaundice. So patients get yellow and they get itchy, but they don't really have any pain. 
Um, and they're usually found a little bit earlier because it just takes a small tumor to block off your bile duct. So we can generally find those. So I think that if you have itching that's all over your body and you notice that your skin's a little yellow or your eyes are a little yellow, that's something that should be alarming and that you should go see your doctor about that. Now, if you have a tumor that's in the body or the tail of your pancreas, sometimes these are not found until a whole lot later. And a lot of times they get presented when people have lost a bunch of weight or they have back pain or abdominal pain. Or sometimes if it gets really big, you can actually feel an abdominal mass. So cancers of the head are a little bit earlier and those are the ones that are associated with jaundice. So if you look yellow or your family says you look yellow, you should go see your doctor. Dr. Koba? No, no, I agree with Linda. Um, jaundice, typically one of the earlier signs uh, that we see for pancreatic cancer, especially in the head, or particularly in the head. Okay, this is an interesting question. And, uh, you know, I, I, both of you can weigh in on this question. What is the life expectancy of someone 87 years of age with diabetes, lung disease from smoking, who had a tumor could not be removed, assuming the pancreas, but the spleen was removed. I don't know, that's all I have here. I'm not sure what the, uh, I, I, I don't know if it's a patient was just uh, had an exploratory and or they could not remove it or they were not a medically fit patient for surgery. Um, but maybe I think that's reasonable to decide to how one would approach someone who has advanced, locally advanced pancreatic cancer or is medically not fit to have a curative surgery. How, um, number one, Dr. Wong, how do you make that assessment? And number two, Dr. Hakoba, uh, what would be the therapeutic options for that patient? I think, you know, reading over the question, it's always hard to predict life expectancy. I think they only do that on TV and soap operas. But in, in the real life, it's really tough to predict. And sometimes people live a lot longer than we think or, or, we, or we predict. And, you know, we'd have to, you know, take each patient and look at the whole patient. Um, and even if tumor can't be removed, you know, that's maybe something that Dr. Akoba and his chemotherapy might be able to do something you know, depends. Not every 87 year old looks the same. So it's hard to make any predictions. For that. Dr. Koba, yeah. what would you offer this patient if uh, they showed up at your office and Dr. Wong had seen the patient and said, uh, you know, surgery is going to be a difficult. Well, they said spleen was infected and the pancreas could not be removed after addition. So so as far as um, management, this is something or someone for whom the geriatric assessment can be very helpful. Um, 87 years old with some comorbid illnesses, um, but also <clears throat> it'd be good to know in terms of functional status, um, what the patient's able to do on their own. Uh, and that may help us to make a decision in terms of uh, the appropriateness of chemotherapy and which chemotherapy medication might be helpful. Um, and another thing we hadn't discussed because it sounds like it may be a localized cancer uh, is radiation. So we talked about surgery and chemotherapy, but in some pancreatic cancers that cannot be removed with surgery, radiation can sometimes be helpful in controlling it. Okay. Um so just one last uh, part to this, uh, to this hour, I wanted to ask each of you, since both of you have been in the field for a long time, and both of you have treated innumerable cases of pancreatic cancer, uh, where do you see the field going in the next five years? And I'll start off with Dr. Wong in terms of any you know, detection, therapeutics, research. Um, where do you see it going in five years? Where are we going to be? I think I would hope for early detection with um, something called a liquid biopsy. I'm hoping one day that we can draw your blood and figure out what kind of cancer you have just based on 
things that your tumor cells are going to release into the bloodstream. And I'm hoping we can find out more about the burden of your cancer and the extent of your cancer just based on um, a blood test. And I, that's what I'm hoping for. And so, you know, one day, maybe when you go to the doctor, you would get your blood drawn when you're 40 and they'll tell you all the cancers that you have or you might get one day. And maybe we can um, you know, try to find cancers early in those patients that have certain chemicals in their blood. And then maybe we can do better surgery and earlier surgery just because we found them earlier. That's what I'm hoping for. Dr. Koba? Yeah, no. Uh, similarly, I think early detection is um, where I hope we'll make our next uh, really big steps. Um, I don't think that we can do much more as far as chemotherapy. Um, you know, the more medications we add, the more toxicity we've come across. And so if we're able to find cancers earlier, hopefully it'll mean less treatment, less side effects. Um, and like Linda was saying, there are some tests that if they're not commercially available, they may be soon. Um, although I'm not sure the data are 100% uh, confirmatory, but they will look at uh, the possibility of identifying cancer DNA in the blood. You know, we got a, a one more question. I'm gonna, and we have a few minutes. I'm just gonna ask the directors that uh, Dr. Koba is for someone who is stage three or four with limited other issues, is it better to be more aggressive with chemotherapy or less frequent given that there are side effects to chemo versus eventual resistance to chemotherapy? So what is the strategy uh, for these patients with non-surgical treatment of their pancreatic cancer? the number of drugs, the intensity of the drug, the scheduling of the drugs? Yeah, uh, so that's a, it's a great question. Um, and we take into account a number of things. One is, um, you know, first and foremost, what is the patient's goal? Um, you know, a lot of people, they'd like to live longer, um, but most of us don't want to live longer at the risk of, you know, any toxicity, any side effects. You know, we were willing to accept a certain amount. <clears throat> and so trying to gauge what this person would want. Um, similarly, some medications cause hair to fall out and some don't. Some cause damage to the nerves like numbness and tingling and others don't. And so if there are specific side effects that the patient would like to avoid. Um, and then also, are there symptoms that the cancer is causing? So if the cancer is causing pain or weight loss and the patient is having more symptoms because of the cancer, um, I tend to recommend a more aggressive approach to try and um, relieve those symptoms. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So our time is nearly up. Uh, so before we wrap this session up, I'd like to just remind our audience attendees to fill out the uh, survey. The organizers of these lectures depend heavily on your feedback to improve in uh, planning future lectures. With that, on behalf of the UH Cancer Center, I would like to thank our expert speakers on their excellent talks, and especially you, the audience, for attending this evening's lecture. So have a great evening, be safe, and aloha to all of you. Thank you.